Welcome, everyone. Hey, this is a podcast that explores various aspects of addiction, potentially focusing on personal stories of recovery, scientific perspectives, societal impacts, or related topics. This podcast often features discussions with experts, individuals in recovery, therapists, and advocates to offer insights and support to those affected by addiction or seeking more information about it. Welcome to another episode of The Other Side of Addiction. I am your host, Al Richards, and today we got a different topic. Enjoy coming home. And our beautiful, lovely guest, Lori, is going to explain what that means. So, Lori, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to be with us. You are very welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It is Absolutely. truly an honor to be on this podcast. You're amazing. Oh, well, well, thank you so much. And and it was so great to see you pop into a networking group because I hadn't seen you for so long. And it was like all of a sudden this angel walks in through Aww. the door and comes up and gives me this huge hug. And that was you. So thank you so much. You bet. Thank you, too. So thank you for being there. Absolutely. Okay, so what the heck is it that you mean by enjoy coming home? So um, I am like a documentary freak, more so than movies. I love to watch documentaries. And uh, there's a documentary on Netflix that um, is about the making of We Are the World, the song that the so many talented artists came together in the 80s to record this song and all donated their time and their talent to basically record this song and change the world and so uh that kind of correlates with the term giver's gain and I will get into that in a little bit too because giver's gain is a huge part of my life so anyway uh at the end of the documentary it's so amazing to see how it all came together and um at the end of the documentary Lionel Richie who I was a big fan of in the eighties. I don't know if many people that watch this are going to be like our age, um, you know, that great age that we are, <laughs> but, um, but uh, so Lionel Richie at the end of the show says that his dad told him one day, enjoy coming home. And he asked his dad, what does that mean? And his dad explained to him that eventually one day, the buildings are still going to be there, but the people inside aren't going to be there. And so that is huge for me um, because I'm very much a nostalgia type person. And so the way that was worded, it was like perfect because so many times in my life, I would look at experiences or I would look at things that I was going through or, you know, whatever's going on. And I would think, I don't want this to end or I'd get really sad if something special was ending. But the way that he worded that sentence, I was like, that is absolutely true because the buildings will still be there, but all the wonderful people that you or that I had the pleasure of being with are going to be gone. And so it was, to me, it was just a huge, huge sentence when he said that I was like, that is so perfect with my life. So anyway, that's you know, where that came from. I, I believe it it falls into all of our lives, really, right? And right. being involved with the recovery community, I have seen so much of this. So, you know, yeah, people go to these recovery events and a lot of people know one another because either they were in the same recovery center as them or they went to detox together or maybe they both have gotten themselves where they wanted their lives to go. And now they're, you know, certified peer support specialists and they work together yeah. or they know of one another, whatever yeah. it may be. And whew, at, at our healing Utah event summit last October, we did a little presentation of those that lost their battle. And it was very, very emotional. And that's what that reminds me of, right? How how grateful we need to be for one another, that we are literally 
not necessarily, I, I guess you could look at it as we are also the building, right? Because one day, Absolutely. Maybe, maybe even the building will be torn down because you're seeing a lot of that happening in Salt yes. Lake, right? A lot of old buildings that I remember being there when I was a little boy yes. are now gone because they're building studios and apartments and Ooh, stuff, yes, you know, so it, it means these relationships yeah. mean so much because one day they they will be gone. Absolutely. And I remember being younger uh, and my parents, we lived in West Jordan and we had, you know, it was really undeveloped around me because when I was a kid, it was like, you know, late seventies, early eighties. And there That's was where just, I grew up, Lori. Yeah, oh, Jordan. nice. Yeah. So, you know, fields like a store here and there and then fields and then a store here and there. But uh, I, I remember Polaroid cameras. My dad was taking some pictures with a Polaroid camera one day of, like a field or nothing and I, I remember saying dad why are you taking a picture of these and he said because one day it won't look like that anymore and I thought ah and I have found that to be so true and when I when I first started using it was I mean I was 26 years old when I started using definitely older Late knew bloomer. way better. <laughs> yeah. Did it anyway, but I grew up with a really strict mom. Um, and so I was like terrified of her. Not that she was really mean, but she was this short, half Yugoslavian, half Italian, Catholic mom that was just really strict. And so I didn't dare do anything because boy, she and she was only she was only like five foot tall, but she would whoop my ass if I got out of line in a heartbeat. She probably still will, but uh so anyway, I started using really late in life and I, uh, I had my oldest son at the time and he was five or six. I can't remember. And, uh, he ended up going to live with his dad and I started using cocaine and then switched to meth because after my son went to live with his dad, now I'm free and clear, right? I could party hardy. I could do that. I don't have any responsibilities. And I was working at a tavern in Murray and, um, so drinking, doing cocaine as much as possible and, you know, whatever other kind of behavior comes with that type of stuff. And so then I got pregnant again with, um, who's now my second son. And so, um, and it was almost like by this time, my family had kind of, they knew what was going on. So back in like the er late nineties, there wasn't this recovery stuff like there is now. You didn't get offered help. If you were using, you were shunned and shamed by people. Families were like, I'm not going to say that that's my daughter. I'm not going to say, you know, it was just like an isolated feeling, which obviously makes the addict go further into addiction. And I'm not blaming my family. It was just the way it was then. And so uh, anyway, over the course of the next eight years, I proceeded to like shred my life to pieces Basically, <laughs> I had my son and then I had, uh, and so then I, it was just kind of me and him for a while. And that, and I was, went back to work at the tavern and I was so tired because I had a newborn. I was babysitting my niece and I was working at the tavern from six at night till two in the morning. So I knew some people that had math and I'm like, okay, I need something for energy. I am just running ragged. And I think I was 27 or eight at this time. And I begged my friend and he's like, I don't want to give it to you because it's so powerful and so addicting. And I'm like, look, I'm already doing cocaine. I just hate that come down feeling. So he, I was able to get meth from him. And that was a game changer. And so, cause I had the energy, I had what I needed to work and be a ma, a single mom to my baby thinking I was being a good mom and then babysit my niece. So over the next couple of years, things kind of went really bad. And then, uh, I would, you know what? I ended up pregnant again. And so <laughs> this time I didn't tell anybody. I didn't say anything about it because I knew I was definitely way deep in an addiction. I could barely take care of the baby I had. It was very irresponsible behavior on my part to do all that. Um, and so uh, when he was born, I placed him for adoption uh, through Catholic Community Services. And that's a whole other story. We don't definitely don't have enough time for that. But um, I I picked the adoption and it was a closed, it was an open adoption from when he was born to when he was five. And then 
uh, I would get letters and pictures twice a year. So anyway, sealed it when he was five. And so when I made that decision to do that, I, I didn't think anything through. I, I mean, everything just kind of, when you're using everything, just kind of, um, it's like, yeah, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. And then all of a sudden you're faced with it. You don't know how to process. I couldn't process normal thoughts at that time. So that was the choice I made, which was the best choice for him for sure. But then after, after I got clean, that was a choice I suddenly had to deal with because when you're high and when you're using, ah, it, you know, I can't feel real feelings. I don't know. You know, I'm not going to feel yeah. that sadness and that, what did I do type of feeling until I sober up. So anyway, so then he, uh, ended up being with a wonderful family. And so I'm very grateful that they were there and that they kept him safe and raised him great. And, um, I recently found him. So to 20 in 2021, I found him and it was, it's just been beautiful ever since. And he's a first responder. He's a firefighter. And I mean, his parents are so great and it's literally like a dream come true that I would have found him because the way that happened too was really insane. But anyway, so then fast forward. And then I meet my ex-husband. And so then we are together and we have a baby and this time it's a girl. And so now, because I'm married and I think my life is more stable, even though I'm still using, <laughs> um, I have this daughter. So anyway, all of that, you know, it eventually leads into using so much criminal behavior, whatever is happening. So I really kind of just went out of control. And in 2007, or, well, yeah, in 2007, I was finally federally indicted on a lot of stuff that I had been doing. Checks, credit card fraud, identity theft, you know, the whole shebang that goes with addiction. Right. Of, especially with meth, meth and identity theft and stuff. It's like it goes hand in hand and check stuff. And I don't know if it still does, but at the time it did. So 2007, I'm federally indicted. And the day before, the, the federal system works a little bit different than the state system. So back in 2007, um, they will federally indict you, but you're working, not working, but you're in contact with whoever, they have like somebody in charge of your case, basically. My postal, the postal inspector that was in charge of my case, um, he said, I will definitely let you know when the charges are filed and you will surrender to the courthouse at your initial appearance. And at that time, is when they will tell you, you know, if you'll get out on pretrial release or if you'll just be held in custody. There's at that time, there was no bail for federal offenses. I think maybe if you hired the right attorney that could fight for bail, but it was either pretrial mm -hmm. release for the feds or you're going to jail. <laughs> so, so when I found out that he had filed the charges, I was like, oh, I'm not going to go to court. Of course, I'm not going to go to court. Why would I go to court? Because I know I'm going to jail, right? So anyway, I pulled a few manipulative moves then and tried to change my court date. Uh, long story short, here come the feds to my house to arrest me. So September 27th, 2007 was the day I went to jail on my federal stuff. And so the next morning I woke up in Salt Lake County Jail. My my kids are, you know, of course, my by this time, my oldest son's living with his dad. My middle son's living with my parents and my daughter's living with my ex. And I had placed... Parker for adoption. And so I woke up and I'm like, what am I doing? This is so insane. How I was 36 years old. When am I going to, you know, get through this? It was a good 10 years of using and shredding everything. So, uh, ended up not getting out on pretrial release, which was the best thing that could have happened. But at the time you're thinking this is the worst thing that could have happened, obviously. Right. And so, for the next two years, I was locked up. I was in Salt Lake County Jail, and then I was in Davis County Jail, and then I went to federal prison in California. And so um, I really I really did have one of those aha moments where I was like, this is it for me. Like, this is it. I am going to do better. And this part, everybody kind of chuckles at, and I kind of chuckle at too, but this is huge for me. And now I realize how much our, how much is going into our head and what our body is taking in subliminally. I was a huge dog, the bounty hunter fan. When I was using every morning, I would watch dog, the bounty hunter on a &E. like two hours, three hours worth of dog, the bounty hunter. And I don't know if you know anything about him. 
he's kind of changed over the years, but his family at one time did a lot of wonderful things for people in addiction. So every morning, I don't know if you've ever seen the show, but when they would get the bad guy and put him in jail or put him in the car and then that ride to jail, they would give him a pep talk and dog would tell him, you know, you, you could do better than this. And he'd really touch on stuff that meant a lot to them. So they would go to the jail and they would think on that advice or on that stuff that he had just told them. So all of this time that's going into my head, even though I'm using that's going into my head subliminally, I'm not really thinking about it. But then when I started sobering up and I was like, this is it. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't even want to use anymore. It finally dawned on me. I was listening to all that advice. It was going into my head. And so when it was my turn, if you will, to be arrested, obviously not by dog, but when it was my turn to take that last ride to jail, all that started coming back. And I was just like, everything he said to all those people that he took to jail he said to me too. Wow. So, yeah. And so, cause it, I mean, I, there was just never a doubt in my head that when I got out, I was going to do the right thing. Like I was done. I was done with this criminal life. So, um, I credit that a whole lot, but so when I got out of prison in 2009, federal prison, uh, and I had to go to the halfway house, horrible. I hate the federal halfway house. Um, but again, there wasn't a lot of this type of stuff that they that there's now. There wasn't like this, uh, these Facebook pages for recovery. There wasn't a lot of resources out there at the time for people in recovery. Um, you didn't necessarily talk about it a lot. It was still a little bit taboo. This was in 2009. And so as I was starting my journey over again, and I was at the halfway house, I got out in the summer of 2009, and you had to get a job. I'm 38 years old. Who's going to hire me? The only experience I have in life is tending bar and waitressing at my dad, my stepdad's cafe. And I don't have any skills. Like who's going to hire me? Plus I just got out of federal prison. Come on. Who's going to want me, you know? And, um, but I was very dedicated. And for the next three weeks, when I put on my paper that where I was job searching, cause you had to turn that in every day. So they knew where you were going. I really went to all those places and it, some were McDonald's, some were Burger King. I didn't care where I got a job. I just wanted to get a job because I was so excited to really start my life and get things back to normal. But what is normal when you've used for 10 years and then you go to prison for two years and you come out 12 years later and you're like, what is normal? Like, what? Yeah. where do I even start living normal again? And so it was a huge struggle. But anyway, I, I ended up getting a job at Zerker's party store in Midvale and minimum wage, seven twenty five an hour at 38 years old. And I'm working with these, these young kids that were in high school. Some of them still, some of them had just graduated from high school. And so they're talking about, you know, their, their school or, or whatever's going on in their life. And I'm just looking around thinking they are probably thinking, who's this old lady and why is she here? <laughs> you know, but I was so happy and excited to be there because I felt like that was another step towards my changing my life type thing. And nobody at Zerkers knew except for the management about my past. One of the stipulations when you get a job and you're at the federal halfway house, and I don't know if it's changed since then, but is you had to tell your potential employer everything. You had to tell them you were just got out of prison. This is what your charges were. You're in the halfway house now. And so when they, when Zerkers hired me, they hired me without knowing any of that. Once you get the job, that's when they would send an employment specialist out to talk to that employer and say, this is what's going on. Do you still want to have them here? And so oh, he, the employment specialist went out and I paced the floor for two hours waiting for him to come back. I'm not, I mean, I paced the floor waiting for him to come back. And he finally came back and he came in and I was like, what, what? And he goes, oh. I forgot to go to Zerker's and I'm like, what? And he goes, I'm just kidding. And he's like, I'm just kidding. He's like, they still want you. And I just took that. That was the hugest blessing ever. I was like, yes, they're taking me knowing what I had done, giving me that chance. And that was the first moment of real acceptance back into society. Because yeah. again, yeah. back then it wasn't like it is now. So it wasn't like there was not as much opportunity for people in recovery at that time. So that was kind of like the stepping stone that I needed to take. And so, 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 so to pause you just for a minute, 
here in all this, it's it's like what the talk, what the caption was, right? Enjoy yeah. coming home. Yes. So I'm, I'm picturing it, especially when you said you go to prison, watch Dog the Bounty Hunter, and then all these things started coming into mind. It's like you're yeah. starting to come home, right? Right. Lori is actually starting to come back. The true yes. Lord, right? She's yes. starting to figure things out. And Absolutely. You go and you get this job. And here it is. It's it's another opportunity yeah. for coming home, right? And the joy right. felt when they said, yes, they still wanted you. <clears throat> so I love how yeah. the caption, enjoy coming home, has just right. really, if you think about it, just fit in with with both of those. Yes. Uh, if I mean, 100%. Because to me, when I look at places now, that I have spent time in or that I have worked at. I mean, after I left Zerkers, I was there for a year and then I got a great opportunity at a medical man manufacturing facility and I was there for 10 years and they took me on knowing everything that I, you know, I had been through and stuff. And it was like, that's where I grew the most. And I went through several different departments from manufacturing all the way up to accounting when I left. And the, it was a kind of a smaller family owned company and the original owner sold the business in 2020 and a corporation took over. And that was just too much because it was changing just too much. And I couldn't. And so I ended up leaving there. Corporations over good companies all the time. They ruin I them as far as I'm concerned. Thing. Yeah, for sure. And that's what happened because we had a really great bond at that company. It was really family and they were very accepting. And this is where Givers Gain comes in for me also, because when I was at Max Tech was, is, was the name of it. And see, Max Tech is still there. The building's still there, but it's different now because the people inside that building are not the people that I was around. It, it's not the same people. So that is perfect. That's like one of the things when Lionel Richie said that line, I just went, that was Max Tech for me because that's when I really grew huge after I got home from prison, learned so much. And then all of a sudden it was gone. And so, but the building's still there. Yeah. So, um, but while I was at Max Tech um, at the time, Mary was one of the owners and she would send everybody to, if they wanted to go to a school called Rapport Leadership International. And it's a school for personal development. And a lot of people resist. Um, nobody really wants to go to that first class because you hear like really intimidating stuff. They make you do what? They, what? I can't do that. I can't do that. <laughs> so I went on the weekend of my birthday weekend in 2013 to the first course and we got there Friday night and it was torture until like one o'clock in the morning. And then you go and you sleep for like five hours and then you have to be right back up and you're, it, and it's like military stuff kind of almost. And so sat, that was Saturday of my birthday. I thought, what am I doing here? I should be home with my kids. I hate this place. I hate everything. I just want to go home. But I'm out in the, in Alamo, Nevada, in the middle of nowhere. And they do that on purpose. So you can't leave. <laughs> <laughs> but then by that Saturday night is when the transformation starts. And so by the time I went to sleep on my birthday that year at Rapport, I was like, this is the best birthday that I could ever even ask for because I felt such a change already happening in my body. So anyway, that led me to my rapport journey. So rapport journey, you take other courses and you become a master graduate. And then you could go back and help the trainers with the other people that are learning, that are taking these classes. And um, I do that every chance I get. So I'm a master graduate and I go back and I'm on team is what it's called. All, every chance I get because rapport has been such a huge part of my life. So I know you and I, Al, were talking a little bit before the podcast about resistance yeah. and when we resist things. And I resisted that and I went and it changed my life. And in my, in my recovery world, rapport is huge. That's a huge part of my recovery. I wouldn't be where I am clean 16, almost 17 years without rapport. So that, but in, in that there's in one of the classes, power communication, the theme for that is giver's gain. And it's talking about when you, when people are givers and what you receive back and they don't mean give them money and give this, it's giving time, it's giving kindness, it's giving anything you can and the feeling you get inside to be a giver. 
givers gain, takers lose is the theme. And so over the years, I've really seen how that is. And so that's kind of what I, where my big promotion on givers gain and being kind and random acts of kindness and things, that all comes from rapport because people love that. And, you know, in this world today, who couldn't use a little kindness? Who couldn't oh, use, yeah, right? Support, you know, and that's not financial support. It's give somebody a hug. Hold the yeah. door open for some. It's just nice things like that. Smile at someone, right? Right. Absolutely. I mean, so where where do you think your life could have end up, ended up if you didn't follow through? Because like you said, before we before we started getting on the show, we talked about how I like to say the opposition. The opposition puts fear in us, right? Absolutely. They, they put fear in us because how many times in our life did we not do something because of the fear of being judged or being uncomfortable right. or right. not knowing where it's going to go, right? Yeah. Where it could have changed our life in so many different ways. And and it maybe yeah. it might not have been the greatest thing. However, that usually ends up turning out to be the the greatest blessing in so my much. in my life experiences right because yes there's so many so things much we, we talked about we even talked about last night right with the yeah. event that we went to last night about the fear of not going and and every time i didn't want to go somewhere and i said you know what i'm going to stick with my word i'm going to do it i'm going to follow through and i did it not once has it ever failed me not yep. once and i'm so grateful that I went so that's with very you true. not going and you that let's say this report thing was in the middle of a city where you could have walked out yeah do you think you'd be where you're at in your life right now if you would have done that um I don't think I would be there at all where you know absolutely not every decision that I have made since I got home from prison has led me to where I'm at today. And some of those decisions have been bad and some of those decisions have been hard. And I just kind of learned from it and went, eh, that was a teaching lesson. So now I'm going to move forward. Um, my, uh, with the addiction, at, you know, once I got home from prison and I, and I was sober and clean, my, my oldest son, had now developed uh, opiate and heroin addiction. So he was 16 when I got out of prison and he uh, had left his dad. To, his dad was quite abusive. And so he had left his dad and was being cared for by his best friend's mom. Because here's his mom in prison now and his stepdad trying to do the best he could with our daughter. But, you know, when you're using and you think you're doing great and you're not. And so... Anyway, um, so by the time I got home, he was on uh, on heroin and he was only 16 and no, excuse me, he was 18. He was 18 when I came home um, and he was using and his friend had inherited $40,000 at 16. They were both 16 at the time that he inherited this money. His mom had died by suicide. His grandma died and all this money got left to him. And at 16 years old, the insurance company, the life insurance people handed him $40,000. Mason. So what do you think two 16 year olds with $40,000 and basically no parents around, what do you think they're going to do? It's part I mean, of time. Yeah, absolutely. So by the time I got home, my son was on heroin and I didn't know it for a couple of months. And then, you know, the signs start showing up and stuff. And, uh, it, he, he fought that he went through that battle for 14 years. And there were times I just wanted to kill him because I thought, you know what? I'm clean. Why can't you do this? You just don't want to, you just don't want this. You don't want to try. You don't want to, you know, you don't want to change. You don't want to face life. And so I feel like I could have done a lot different now looking back on that. I don't understand the opiate addiction because I've never been on opiates. Meth is a completely different addiction and, and everybody's different anyway, when it comes to their addiction but kind of the same. So I didn't understand 
the need that his body had for that opiate and that heroin and that it's not as easy as it was for me. It's not, it wasn't as easy for him. So for, but for a long time, I kind of, you know, held that against him or um, he'd get in trouble. He'd go to jail. He'd go to Odyssey house. He'd get clean. And then he um, developed that. It, it's a pretty serious bacterial infection. And he went to the hospital and he had part of his spine removed at one point and titanium rods put in because the infection had gotten so bad in this blood infection that it like was a big lump and it settled on his spine. So they had to literally go in, cut out part of his spine, cut out that in that in uh, basically where it was poison, cut it out um, and then put titanium rods in to replace it. And that surgery was like a 10 hour surgery. And I remember sitting in the waiting room at St. Mark's Hospital just crying so hard because I couldn't save my son. Like he's in there going through this and it's my fault because I always blame myself because it has to be my fault because I was an addict because I wasn't there for him because of this, because of that, you know, so I was taking that on. So anyway, he uh, made it through the surgery and, you know, the doctors at the time were very honest. You're not going to live if you don't quit. And so he had to take antibiotics for the rest of his life. If he gets the blood infection again, he could die. Well, two years later, he gets it again. But this time, it's not as bad. So the doctors are like, mm, we don't really know if he's going to live. Put him back in the hospital. Another six weeks in the hospital. But this time, he decides to go to Odyssey House after. So he goes to Odyssey House after and was only there for a very short time and then came back out and then started using and never got clean again. And then finally, a Last year on March 16th, uh, 2023, he died and it wasn't an overdose. It was um, his body was just full of infection again, broken down. His heart was he had gotten endocarditis from this blood infection. So his heart at the time he went to the emergency room was only functioning at nine percent. And so um, when he went to the emergency room, his feet were really swollen. None of us knew what was we, I knew he was drinking heavily, but you know, none of us really knew what was going on. So he goes to the emergency room on March 5th and they're just like, there's nothing we can do. You're dying. And so he literally held on from March 5th to March 16th. And he finally passed March 16th at like 10 40 at night. And so that was almost like the worst longest two weeks of my life because you're watching your child suffer, totally suffer from this. He did it to himself. Yeah, we, we've all done that stuff to ourselves. And as a mom, not being able to take that and make him better, except for over the years, trying to support him and doing what we can and being, you know, like super supportive about his recovery and stuff. But as a mom, you think I failed, I failed. And, and then watching him just like, hold on for those two weeks and having that, that heartache of going, please just die already. Just let go. Because that was more torture to watch him go through that two weeks. than I think the 14 years, literally the 14, wow. it, it was that, I mean, you're hanging as a parent or all of my, my other kids, my mom, everything we all were going through you're hanging by a thread waiting for that moment to happen, knowing it's going to happen. You can't stop it from happening and never knowing when it's going to happen. And so it was very intense. And it's almost like so, a Russian roulette, right? Because oh you've been in that God. chamber and you, you know, eventually your odds, it's, it's going to click right. in that spot. And in the back of my head, I knew, I, I knew as a mom, um, you know, I just knew that his day that he would die from the disease. Um, I guess I thought it would look different. I thought maybe it would be an overdose. I thought he would, you know, take fentanyl and overdose or something. Um, so in my wildest dreams, I never pictured it to be the way it was, but, um, looking back and thinking sometimes to him still, you know, why didn't you just listen? Why didn't you just do like, there's so many people his age, he died at 31 and there are so many people in that age bracket basically that have died from you know overdoses and from opiates and it's like 
it's huge. Obviously, we see it getting worse. Fentanyl is everywhere. And you see the destruction. And there's just no way to stop it. And it's so hard to see all these people that are so amazing and had just have such such great things about them that they're hooked on this because of the disease they have and it's just an uphill battle so yeah um i mean i'm very grateful my my life went different i'm very grateful that i've been clean and sober for almost 17 years i'm very grateful for the experiences and the places that i've been again the coming home the center that i'm working at right now you know i it wasn't quite the type of place that I had even ever heard about. I had worked at the, at my job for 10 years. And then I went to kind of another corporate job for a year and I wasn't really happy there. And so my friend who had been, who's been my friend for many, many years told me about this center that he was working at about these machines and these, they can save your life. Basically they can do this and they can do that. And I, and it gives you energy. And I mean, he was just so excited. And I'm like, well, sign me up. I mean, energy, come on. Who doesn't want energy? And so anyway, he had to leave. He, he was working at this center with the energy enhancement system. And he had to go take 30 days off because he had to have open heart surgery. So he said, well, you know, since you're not working, would you want to fill in for 30 days? Oh, why not? Sure. I'll see what it's about. You know, knew nothing about natural healing, knew nothing about the energy enhancement system. None of that. So I start working at the center and I start learning about the machines and what they can do. And again, it's called the energy enhancement system. And I start meeting these really great people and these healers. And over the next year and a half, you know, lots has happened and we moved to a different location, but the machines are still here. And I've seen the miracles that happen with the machines. And I've met the most amazing people like you and the girl, you know, uh, Caitlin and Rachel from last night, Aya, who's done our sound baths. There's too many. I can't even name all the amazing people that I have met through this, um, through this center. It's been a huge part of my life, but it's now time to move on. And so I was really upset about that last week. And I thought, you know, I've, it's changed these, these machines and the people here have changed my life. And, um, it's like a like-minded group of people that have come together that supported me when my son died. I mean, I needed to be here. I needed to have those friendships. I needed to have that safe space when I went through all that because the people here at the center just were amazing. Um, and so, but like I said, now it's time to move on. And so I had a realization again, enjoy coming home because one day the people won't be there anymore, but the building will still be here. So here we are again to at the end of a of a of something in my life um that i'm going to walk away from that's going to be painful to walk away from but the people that are in the home <laughs> aren't going to be here either so it it's just it all ties back to that enjoy coming home and i actually only heard that quote about a month ago and i guess over the course of the years since i got home from prison and rebuilt my life and have stayed clean. I didn't know how to put into words basically what that meant or, you know, that, and then I think that's why it was so powerful when he said that sentence, because it made sense as to what I was feeling, but I could never put it into words because everything that has happened since I've been home from prison has been obviously an achievement and a milestone for me. When you're rebuilding your life from scratch at 38 years old, taking a job at minimum wage for 725, and I would ride the bus two hours on the way there and two hours on the way back to the halfway house. And I was like, so grateful to do it because it meant a new beginning. And so there's been a lot of homes that I've been through and been in. And so it's been hard to say goodbye to all of those, but that's okay because the people that I have met are still going to be in my heart, in my head, in my, in my life. And so it's okay to once again, kind of shut the door and move on to the next adventure. So, yeah, you know, it's just, it's the, it's the new chapters, right? Cause mm -hmm. I, I am a firm believer. I mean, I'm a very spiritual person. God already knows our path, right? We don't, right. he already knows. Yeah. And we have to go through certain lessons 
And once we figure those lessons out, then he gives us another lesson, right? And and it and it's continuous. Yes. And That's so we true. We get to enjoy coming to so many homes, right? Because right? if if we go back and look at our life where it was at, and, and you just did that, Lori, right? Getting out of prison, getting a job for seven something dollars an hour at your yeah. age, which was nothing, right? Right, I mean, right. A teenager, that's heaven at that time. Yeah, right? exactly. That's a lot of money. However, for right. someone at, at our ages, it's like, oh my gosh, we could almost look like it's it's shameful, right? It's right. We can look at things different ways, but to to see how many homes that you have actually came home to. Right. And the people, I mean, you you nailed it when you said the people. Because when I lost my job in 2009 and, and, and decided to change who I was as an individual. And I shared a little bit of that last night at the event about my weekend partying. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's how I lost my job. Oh yeah. And to see where my life has taken me now and meeting amazing individuals like yourself, right. And like Jamie and, and and Kobe and Whitney and, uh, and yeah. um Jackie and I mean there's so yeah. many of them. I I could I could right. spend hours here trying to you know move all these names forward. Yeah. But so many people have helped me come home. Right. And not even realizing it at the time. And yeah. Every single person has helped me grow and some have literally only been in my life for a blink. And others are still there and they're there yeah. for a reason because they're still there to help me continue on through my journey and to lead me into my next portion, or I like to say the next chapter. Yeah. You know, and, and I've, I've been chatting with this gal and we went and had coffee together uh, about a couple weeks ago and, and we really started hitting it off about spiritual stuff. Right. And, and she happened to message me the other day and she goes, Al, if you think about it, we're in the fourth quarter, right? We're in the fourth quarter of our life. And it's, oh, this is yeah. our time that everything yeah. counts, right? Right. The love, the respect, how, right. how we look at life so differently. It, it's right. It's, we've, it's like if you've ever had a chance to be on stage where they have the curtains and, and sometimes, sometimes they have little performances in between each curtain. And it's like one curtain goes by and it's still not you. Then another curtain goes by and until yeah. it reaches your time. Right. Yes. Yet you just, you had to see all those other performances. Right. To get you to love and appreciate where your life is at. Right. Right now. And, and it sounds 100%. like that's what's happened with your life? Cause it, I know what's happened in mine. Oh yes. Huge. I mean, and uh, the spiritual journey that you talked about, you know, I just started my spiritual journey when I started working in, it was the summer of, of 2022. And I started working around these machines and meeting these people that were teaching me about spirituality and teaching me about stuff. And in the conversations that ha I would have with them, they were just conversations, but, and, and I don't think the individual even realized how much they were teaching me and how much that was changing my life. And yeah. so, uh, it's been a, a huge blessing and it's going to be sad and it's going to be hard to close this chapter, but none of the memories and none of what I've learned has to stay in this chapter. Everything can move forward with me to the next chapter. And, um, and I'm so just excited for that. And last night, the breath work, absolute breakthrough for me. Oh, yeah. So if you look at the universe spiritually, yes, God definitely knows where we're going to end up. And I always feel like the universe just kind of gets us to where we're supposed to be. God makes the plan. The universe puts it in motion, so to speak. And so yeah. uh, last night. I was definitely meant to be here for that because that such a game changer. So. You know, again, and really, to, you know, to, to change things up a little bit, Lori, thank you so much for sharing your experience with that. Right. Cause yeah, that, that was very, very touching. And, and I, with you sharing, it touched everyone in that room. 
I mean, it really did. I, I was looking around the room at people's facial expressions and they were just like in, in awe. And, you know, Caitlin and Rachel do such an amazing job and they get to see, right. We've, we've got our blindfolds on or our eye things, whatever you call them. And yeah, they're, they're watching us do this breathing technique and they're, they're yeah. watching all of us. Cause that's their job, right. To make sure right. that we're doing things and that we're not going in a wrong direction or whatever. Yes. And, and they saw what you, they didn't know at the time what it was that you were seeing, but right. they knew something was happening. And, and I even brought up the fact too, that, uh, you know, I don't know if you guys noticed that there was a couple of times I, I was smiling because of what was, what I was seeing. And they're oh. like, Oh yeah, we noticed it. Yeah. I heard and him say I'm that. Like, yeah. Oh my gosh, really? You guys are really paying attention to what's going <laughs> yeah. on. So thank you so much for sharing that. Cause yeah. it touched everyone in that room. It touched me. And, you know, I talked a little bit about last night, tomorrow being the anniversary. And I, I refer to it as the day that my son, his angel day yeah. versus the day he died. I mean, that's the day he became an angel. And that's the day he was set free. Like he was set free of this disease that just, you know, it wasn't going to let go of him. It just was never going to let go. So, um, the, this week has been rough because it's changes coming anyway, because, you know, of things that are, are happening as far as going to the new chapter. Um, so I, I just ha was having a lot of anxiety and I'd heard about breath work and I was really intimidated. And so last night by doing trusting people and by doing the, the breath work and doing the process, that was the huge moment for me where you know, it was getting very intense and I can't even explain breath work, but you know what I'm talking about. And some people that are on listening know what I'm talking about. There gets to be parts of that that are very intense. And yeah. so at this one part, I said, I thought to myself, okay, I need to reel back. I need to dial back my breathing a little bit. You know, I need to kind of start to bring that back in. And clear as a bell, loud as can be in my head, I heard my son say, keep going, mom, you got this. And so, sorry. No, don't be sorry. Don't be sorry at all. Um, and so that was a message for me to keep going with the breathing work, but keep going in general, because I got this. And I'm like, it was huge. It was huge. So. Yeah. And I couldn't stop smiling the whole way home because I had gotten that message from him and I heard him just say that. And I was like, you know what? It's okay. It's, it's okay. And, and I do got it and I'm going to keep going. So it was awesome. Yeah. It was so awesome. Yeah. And you said you heard it as plain as day too, right? Like he was literally it, standing right there telling you just as plain as day, literally. And, and so I kept going and it, you know, when I, when people do breath work, and I could never understand this till I experienced it last night. You're sobbing. You're going through so much. And it wasn't even like I was like sad sobbing. It was just like all of a sudden, oh, okay, where did this come from? And you're just wow. letting stuff out. And so it was just getting really intense. And that's why I was like, okay, I need to dial it back a little bit. And just to hear him as plain as day, I just knew he was there. I knew, and, and I, I have a good friend that I met here at the center and we became very close and she passed away in June of last year and, um, her name's Cindy. And so, uh, all, it was like, Tyler came in and he told me that message. And then all of a sudden Cindy was there with her face and I'm like, where did you come from? But then I realized she's here to help too. Just trust this, keep going, keep going. So it was just the most beautiful experience I could have ever asked for. And hearing my son and just knowing that it's okay to just keep going, you know, it's, it's, I got it. And, uh, tomorrow being that day, we're going to get through it. We got it. We're fine. You know, my kids were going to go to spaghetti factory. That was his favorite. And then we're going to have some dessert and just share memories and look at old pictures of him and stuff and just make it a, a day about him. You know, it's okay. It's okay to keep going. And I think that's where I've had the struggle this last year because it's hard to move forward because in our, in my mind anyway, moving forward means forgetting. And I don't want to ever forget my son, but I have to move forward. So last night, I just felt like that was him saying, move, go, you've got it, just go. Because 
you know, it's okay to move on. It's okay. So yeah, it was huge. Last night was yeah, huge. That, that message could come across in so many different ways, yeah. right? By yes. keep going, you know, keep going by keep doing the breath work, keep going this yep. change that you're thinking about making in your life, you know, and, and, you know, I cannot say I know where people are coming from because I've lost close friends. Thank goodness. And, and I think God knows this. I really don't think I'd be able to handle losing a child. I mean, if I yeah. lost one of my daughters, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. It tears me up inside or, or even like one of the grandkids. Right. Right. And to be able to, so again, I can't, I can't say I understand what people are going through. However, to know, I would think that they're always going to be there no matter what, because I cannot right. see how you throughout the rest of your life, you'll never forget your son ever. Yeah. And you're the choice that you made, I think, in hearing his voice by keep going is his strength coming out to give to you because i i have a good friend who lost her son he was six uh, drowned at one of the recreation places at one of the wave places uh, he was right next to her one second and then the next second he was gone and, and you know and, and she shared on the show how people was blaming her being a bad mom and blah 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 and again right. that stuff really ticks me off because nobody none of them was there to see exactly what happened right, right. It right. happened the way it happened. She beat herself up enough, just like you were beating yourself up about, I was in prison and I could have been there more and this, that, and the other thing. And she finally realized one day, and she got heavy into the drinking and things. And one day she finally woke up and said, you know what? I'm sitting here dwelling on this instead of celebrating the amazing six years I had with him. Yes. And she ended up writing a book about it. And, and that's what she does. They, they celebrate it just like what you guys are going to do on the 16th, right? You're going to yeah. celebrate it because that person changed our lives in one way or right. another. so many, yeah, just so many different ways. So why wouldn't we want to yeah. celebrate it? Right. So much. Instead of tearing ourselves up and going, well, I could have done this or I should have yeah. done that. It's like we we all do the best we can. Right. You know, I mean 100 percent the world is tough, right? And yeah. And, and we got to we got to look at the messages in the mirror and we've got right. to learn the lesson. And you even talked about it a couple times in the show about learning the lesson behind things and yeah. Going. Yeah, and I I when I look at my path that I'm meant to be on that the universe is, is kind of putting me on or it is, I never thought about the universe before I worked here. I never thought about any of this stuff. I was raised Catholic. I had my Catholic beliefs, you know, but as far as spirituality, I didn't have any of that. And in my head, I thought spirituality equaled religion. And I'm like, well, I'm Catholic, whatever, you know? And so I now realize that I was meant to be at this center for the end of his life because I have met so many wonderful people that have taught me so much and have taught me about the signs to look for and have taught me about what happens and how much they are still with us and and to not question the way things happen. That's hard. Going back to even your friend, uh, I have to realize by the lessons I've learned from people here that things are supposed to happen the way they happen. And the way we know that that's how it was supposed to be is because it did. And that's something a lady told me that comes in here sometimes. And so I was like, you know what? I'm going to stop questioning. Even at the end of my son's life, the day he passed, I went to this care center he was at. And I was so at my breaking point and the care center wasn't the greatest. And he was on Medicaid and that was the best Medicaid would pay for. And it was a dump. It wasn't that bad, but it was a dump. I wouldn't want to die there. But my mom said, you know, he doesn't really know where he's at. And it's not like it's so gross that, you know, in, in our brain, I guess I was thinking, oh, it's got to be like such a nice, beautiful room to pass away. Well, that's not life. That's not the reality. 
And so the last day that he was alive, I went up to that place because they wouldn't answer the phone and I was trying to check on him and I had come back to work and I went up there and I lost my shit. And I am the type that tries to spread kindness and love. And I was just at my wit's end. So I look at it and I go, and, and I didn't yell at him. I yelled, I was just really angry with the staff. But what I left his room that day, because he had hung on for so long, I didn't realize that was going to be the last time I saw him. So when I think about the last day at that place and the last interaction that I had with people there, it was horrible. I don't want to think about that. That was the day he died. That was the last time that I was going to see him. He was medicated. He didn't really know what was going on. And I wasn't yelling in front of him or anything. But I think oh, if I could do that again, I would change so much about that day. I wouldn't go up there. I wouldn't yell. I wouldn't. But for whatever reason, it, it was supposed to happen that way. And that so was your, that was your lesson, though, Lori. Right. Yeah. That was your. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it, it happened that Absolutely. way and you realized it. Now, if you wouldn't have realized it, then you would have failed the lesson. Right. That's it, true. Very true. So you, That's powerful. Thank you. You got it. You you yeah. got the lesson. Now you go, okay. And, you know, hopefully that's not something you ever have to go through again. However, right. there could be other issues to still kind of make you lose your temper, <laughs> right? And that's right. coming from somebody who... I went through six months of therapy in my mid twenties to learn how to control a very, very oh. bad temper. Oh, wow. I mean, I was in the emergency center like every other week. Cause I was either putting it through a window, a door or, oh. or walls or, or, you know, I was always having splinters and crap taken out or stitches what? and, and oh, I was kicking gosh. things, but that's what I grew up around. Right. I, I grew up in a family that if things didn't go your way, this is yeah. how you reacted. So again, no, no blaming my parents because they did what they knew, right? Yeah. They, yeah. they learned from their parents and so on and so on. Right. It, it took me till my mid twenties to see someone laying on the floor curled up in a ball because I just hurt them because of my temper where I went, okay, it's time for me to change because I don't, I don't want to be this type of person. And it took that for me to finally learn my lesson. And I'm grateful yeah. it was just, this sounds crazy. I'm grateful that the person was just hurt the way that they were hurt and nothing worse. Yeah. Because right? it could yeah. have been a lot worse. I could have killed them. Right. I could have broke something. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So. For sure. Those lessons. And a matter of fact, Caitlin. The, the lovely gal who taught last night, her brother, Cap, really opened my eyes years ago or last year when we were working on this house and I was talking to him about some stuff that was going on in my life. And, and he goes, Al, what's the lesson behind it? And I went, excuse me? He goes, so what's the lesson behind it? There's a lesson behind it. And I went, I never thought of it that way. So I did. I pondered on that the rest of the day at work about what is the lesson? What's going on? And, and it took me, it, I think it almost took me a week to figure it out. And finally that light bulb went off and I was like, oh my gosh. And now when things happen in my life, that's exactly how I look at it. And I may not get it right. Right. After, right? It, I, I said it took a week or so. And, and I've had some things that's happened since then that it's taken me almost a month. Oh, well, yeah, out. sometimes. Huh? However, yeah. you got to keep you got to keep searching, you know, you got to yeah. keep, keep digging. And pretty soon you get it. And right. I think that's why God puts us on these different paths. For to, sure. To learn and, and to strengthen and become better individuals. Yes. And I was taught by somebody here also that um, if we don't learn that lesson and kind of grow from it, it will be presented again and again and again until you get it, until yep. you understand it. And I have found that a lot um, lately. And so now I realized the lesson and I said, thank you universe. And I am changing the my previous approaches to it. And so now I feel like, okay, now I've learned the lesson. So please stop, <laughs> <laughs> please no more. But it does take that. And I just want to add, because I don't know if we're almost out of time or not, but I just want to add, 
that one of the biggest um, motivators for me since I got home from prison was to, to, to get my kids back and to just show them basically how much I love them. Because in the beginning of all of their lives, I was a mess. I didn't plan any of my kids. I have four kids by four different dads. And I remember thinking when I was getting clean and sober and my kids were still pretty little. And I thought, how am I ever going to tell them? What are they going to think of me? The fact that they all have different dads, how am I ever going to get to my kids and be like, you guys, I'm so sorry, but my, my actions since I came home from prison, showed them how sorry I truly was for everything. And the fact that my kids have forgiven me basically, and I got them back and I did everything I could to get them back. They were always my main motivation to stay clean, to get, you know, these 725 an hour jobs, because that was my goal was to get my kids back. And of course they're all grown now. And my son's now passed on, but the fact that they have just forgiven me. And we joke about the whole bad thing. Sometimes we just all kind of laugh about it. They're like, oh, whatever. They don't care as much as I thought they would care. It's funny. Like we all just, I tell people I have not had the, the regular life. Like my life is a mess. It, no traditional life at all over here. And so, um, and I have two amazing stepsons that, you know, I'm divorced from their dad, but they were around for a lot of this chaos when they were younger. And, and they've forgiven me. And so they have a great bond with, you know, they're all siblings. And so it's a great bond. And, and when my son did pass away last year, the kids and my step kids, they all just rallied around me. They were going through hell and they were just the sweetest. And so at the end of the day, my motivation has always been my kids. I'm so happy and proud of all of them. And I'm proud of my son that passed away too, because he did the best he could with the disease he had. And, um, and I'm proud for those 31 years, you know, he, he fought it a lot and he fought it hard. So anyway. Wow. What an amazing story. You know, Lori, thank you so much for, for you taking bet. time out of your day to, to be vulnerable. You know, I, yeah. I did a post on my Facebook the other day about, you know, people who open up and are vulnerable and they share their stories. They're the real badasses because it takes a lot to yeah. someone to open up and share a part of their life yeah. that they're not proud of, right? Yeah. However, it made them who they are today. And right. me knowing you, and I've only known you for a couple of years. Yeah. I would have not ever known what this past Lori, right? Right. I know I love the present Lori, and that's all that means to me. You know, it's it's who you are as the individual now. Because just what I know of you, you're just an amazing woman. You're a strong Thank woman. You. And Thank you. you. You've got a lot going for you. And, and yeah, you, you definitely should be proud of yourself. That's that's for sure. And Thank you. The love of your kids back. Man, yeah. what an amazing goal. And you did it. You, you freaking did it. No matter right. how hard that road got. So congratulations. Yeah. Thank you so much. That means so much. That's so sweet. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. one one last question. Okay. What does the other side of addiction mean to you? The other well, uh, the other side of addiction to me means pretty much exactly what you just said. Um because uh the there was the me before my my addiction and I now I realized that there were unhealed parts of me and things that I had never dealt with that I needed to deal with. But that's what took me to my addiction. That's what took me to cover that pain and everything. And then the process of going through prison, not getting out, having to actually go to federal prison for two years. Um, so to me, the other side of addiction for me started on July 9th, 2009, the day that I came home from prison to the halfway house. That's the other side of addiction for me. You have the one side where you're using, and then you have the other side when you're cleaning up the mess and living. That's what it means to me. July 9th of 2009. Yeah. That's the day I lost my job of 24 years. Oh. That exact same day. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. 
that was the beginning of my journey as well. That's amazing. And I started on our journey together, not even realizing. That's amazing. Isn't it? That's so amazing. Yes. Yeah. yeah that connection. So I love that. Yes. And I'm very, very grateful to know you and meet you. And I love you and everything that you do for people. You're such a giver. Mm. Givers gain. You are such a giver. So thank you for everything you do. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. You bet. Well, guys, again, man, thank you. I, again, I say this at the end of every show. This show wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for you guys, the listeners, the guests, the past guests, past sponsors, guys, you guys are the ones that's making this a success. And gosh, three years, we hit three years. This show has been going this month, March. Woo! It's Good amazing. job. I mean, Lori's show here is the 260th show. I just cannot oh. believe it. We are so close to 300 already. And I was excited. Good job. About 100. Right. So, yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. That's amazing. Good job. Thank you. That's Thank you because so you're such a giver and you're gaining back from being such a giver. So well, if yeah. that's how it works, then I am definitely grateful and uh, live in gratitude. That's for sure. Me too. I love it. Well, guys, thank you again for all your support. Lori, thank you again for being our guest today. And guys, remember yeah. this. Addiction is giving up everything for one thing. And recovery is giving up one thing for everything. We're out. Bye.